thank you for the uh, privilege and the opportunity to, to come this morning and to share with you a part of what God has been putting on my heart here the last several months. Um, there's often a tendency sometimes when you, you come to someplace new to to give you the, the backdrop to what's going on. I'm going gonna, I'm I'm gonna to avoid most of that this morning and just share with you enough to let you know that for the last several months now, I've been earnestly seeking the Lord as far as what he would have for me to do is in starting a new work on the west side of the county, Stark County. And one of the things that has come into play in my thinking and my reading the scriptures and understanding is what does it look like for a local church to minister to the folks that are there? And what should be the driving motivation and what should be the scriptures that we can go to in order to understand that? So I just want to share this morning some of this process that I've gone through in the scriptures and some of the understanding that God has given me. And hopefully as we dive into it, you'll, you'll be uplifted and blessed and you'll be able to say, yes, that's exactly where we've been and that's what we're doing. And I've seen that confirmation already just reading some of the literature here at the church. So let's ask the Lord's blessing again as we open his word. Heavenly Father, just thank you again for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your great love that you demonstrated toward us and in the giving of your Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that because of him, there's a oneness and a unity that comes into play, that we are united in your son. We are complete in him. And you've called us and you've called us together You've called these folks together here as a local assembly of believers. And you've given them a purpose. And Lord, as we dive into your word, we recognize it again that it is truth. And that it's for us and for our understanding and for our edification. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles this morning, the starting place for me in this process is... Believe it or not, it's in Psalm, Psalm 1, if you'd like to turn there. Psalm 1, and it's dealing with the individual, the individual man of God. So first off, it, becomes, it became very clear to me over the last several years that God is not involved in redeeming or saving institutions or nations for that matter. But he's involved in dealing with individual men and women and bringing them to a knowledge of himself. And so one of the things that's always struck me is Psalm 1 here where it talks about the individual man. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chafe which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So as, as I look at this, the, the, the underlying theme that comes from this psalm is, and if I were going to put a title on this message today, it would be Like a Tree Planted like a tree planted, that is the, the man of God. 
and that is the requirement that God is looking for in his people that they are planted that they understand the wickedness in the world that's around them and they are bringing forth fruit to please him and praise him so I, I look at this as a starting place and as I, as I read these verses and I think about God's desire for the individual man the question that comes to mind especially when I'm looking at considering God you want me to start a work here and how are we going to go about it and what should we be emphasizing and what should we be doing you know it, the question comes how does the local church support and encourage such a person and my thinking and searching on this has been over several months as I said and so the first place I started and it's really interesting because I picked up the the brochure this or my wife picked up the brochure this morning for your for your local church and and so one of the things that God has brought to my mind is is there is there a mission that the local church has and lo and behold it seems that your mission here is the same two verses that I had settled on you could go go and look at some of the posts that I've done over the last several months and you'll find out that I, that I shared a life verse that's been with me since my college days. I shared a ministry verse. The life verse, by the way, is Galatians 2.20. The ministry verse for me is 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is to teach others so that they can teach what Paul has brought forth. But the mission for the church that I would want to be involved in is from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. And if you want to turn there, I'll just read verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. So it comes, it comes to thinking here, this blessed man, this man of God that's planted like a tree beside the waters that brings forth fruit, what is that the church is doing in order to encourage that and to do that? Now we know that Jesus came and he says he draws all men to himself. So as a church, as a body of believers, we recognize that draw that Jesus has. And then, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of it is we got to be involved in seeing people saved. We don't, all, we don't ever want to forget that we're not, we're just not a community of people that get together once a week and have a good time socially. Although that's part of, part of what God's people do is they come together and they encourage one another and so on but that we want to bring people in and then the other part is that here in uh, first timothy 2 is that we want to have them come to the knowledge of the truth so we get them saved and we give them a knowledge of the truth and so if that is true and I believe it is. You folks believe it is. You have it on your brochure as your mission statement. I often think about, you know, the modern literature is the church should have a mission statement and a vision statement and all of these kind of things. And I'm thinking, now, is this a business or is it God's church and God's people coming together? But I think a mission statement is really important and really uh, vital to the understanding of of what God would have us do as a group. So the question comes into play then, well, if this is the mission, if this is what we're going to do, then how are we going to do it? How does that, what does it look like when it's taking place? So flip with me, Will, in your Bi if you will, in your Bibles to over to Ephesians chapter 4. 
and we'll look at some verses here that sort of that describe the end product if you will I spent many 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 years in manufacturing so uh, you'll see those terms carry over from one place to another so the end product of course from Psalm 1 is that the individual man is planted by the river and brings forth fruit but what does the end product look like for a group of people that come together in order to encourage that and so in Ephesians chapter 4 beginning at verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love we may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love so as we read through this and we look at this we find out that first off the individual man the individual woman is built up and is edified and matures but we also see that as a as a as a group of people as a group of God's people that come together pastor Ted or brother Ted was sharing this morning about um, the little flock and that in every age God has had his church if you will his assembly of his people that are true to him and are interested in following him and in this time and in this age we have a, the, the flock if you will although Paul doesn't seem to use that term too much but the group of people is a it's a body it's a body of believers individual members we come together and we build one another up and we encourage one another and we seek to bring people to the point where they become mature and the mature man Ephesians tells us here the mature saint the perfect saint the complete saint is one that isn't pushed to and fro by every new wind of doctrine that comes along but that we're, we're steadfast and true and that we've matured and we've gotten past that point so that we aren't deceived and every time you hear something new it's like oh this sounds really good or oh this sounds really good some of some of us here have probably had that experience that's somewhat Ted based on what you said the last few times you've spoken about you went to this church and you did this and you got involved and I thought I thought a couple weeks ago you said you actually got baptized three different times but that you would get involved and you'd follow the program for a while and then you get upset with them or you'd find out you don't really agree with this and then you go someplace new well that's the idea that's being presented here in Ephesians that when when we're immature as believers we go this direction and then it's like oh wait that sounds really good and so we go this direction and then after a while it's like no wait this sounds really good and we're over here well the mature believer is grounded in the word he is part of a body of believers that come together to encourage one another and to lift up one another and edify each other so that we can become mature and verse 16 there in Ephesians 4 
he says that the whole body we come to the point where we realize that we're a whole body that we're joined together and that we were built up into the love of Christ from that point so that's that's what the product looks like we got an individual who's firmly planted and firmly grounded we've got a a group of folks that come together in order to encourage that and to grow the individual person into Christ and as Paul talks about this here in Ephesians he uses a number of different metaphors if you will regarding ministry in a Christian life in this particular passage we looked at he's using the metaphor of a body and that we we are part of a body we are part of the body of Christ in 2 Timothy 2 he includes a few others he includes as a good soldier in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3 in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5 he talks about us running a race and how that metaphor is used for the life that we find ourselves in Christ doing that we're running a race and it's not a sprint it's an endurance race it's a marathon if you will and then in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6 he talks about the idea of a husbandman and how God is a husbandman and his ministers are husbandmen and they're, they're tending these tender plants, if you will, and causing them to grow up into something that's fruitful and flourishing unto the Lord. Back to Psalm chapter 1 at this point. I wanted to look at that because really when we, we get into it here, we find out that that picture... And one other are the ones that we find repeatedly being brought up and, and brought out. So if you flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now if you want to read through the scriptures, especially Paul's letters, and find out the church that it was most immature you're going to come to 1 Corinthians. You're going to come to the church at Corinth. And he's got two letters there that he's speaking out to them about their immaturity. I remember one time going to a seminar. This is, we were talking about age before church. This was uh, many, many years ago. Back in uh, 19... 79, 1980. There was a guy by the name of Bruce Wilkerson, and he was holding seminars around the United States. It was called Walk Through the Bible Ministry. And so you'd go and you'd spend all day and you'd cover every book of the Bible. And the goal was to get a, a phrase that you could identify with each, each book of the scriptures. Well, first and second Corinthians were sort of grouped together, and the phrase to help you remember what's going on with them was called spanking the Christian lots of immaturity there lots of immaturity taking place in the book of Corinthians and Paul finds himself having to address this issue now I have since come to understand that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is a process of correcting the behavior that Paul says your understanding of justification should produce in your life. And of course you get that, you get that doctrine from the book of Romans. But first and second Corinthians is you're not living up to what you say you believe. And so we've got all of these issues coming up. Well when you get to chapter 3 you find out there's an issue of division within the body. And in the, early, in the early portions of that, you look at verse 3. He says, this is 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas you 
There is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. And then he goes on and he, he gets back to this metaphor of being a husbandman, if you will. He says, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. In verse 7, so then neither is he that plants anything, neither is he that waters, but it's God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive a reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So those are the last two metaphors that, that I see Paul talking about where he's dealing with not just individuals, but he's dealing with groups of people that come together with a common goal to understand scripture and to mature. The first one is the whole idea of husbandry and a planting that takes place. And then the second one he says, he says there, ye are God's building. Now we could, we could jump around a whole bunch of scriptures to look at both of those and that's not necessarily my intention today. Ephesians chapter 2, towards the end of that chapter, talks about us being built together as a temple that God can inhabit. So not only does the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit indwell us, but also when we come together as the body of Christ, we find out that we become a temple that's been built up in order for God the Father to indwell inside of us. Corporately. We come together and we represent represent God. But in verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.10 here, to take this body thing a little, little further, he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise matter, master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, God's interested in having us take these things that are common in every day, they were common then, they're common now, and help us to understand this is what we are when we come together. We're, we're a, a plant, if you will, or a, a garden that God has brought us together and caused us to grow and become fruitful. Or we're a building. And of course, Paul says that he's, he was given the responsibility to be the master builder for that. And in such, he's the one that laid the foundation. And that no other foundation can be laid than it is laid, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a, an interesting story about when I was growing up. It goes a little bit beyond the foundation, but in 1964, um, my dad decided to build onto the house, and he did most of the work himself. He put the foundation in, but this time, rather than doing the cement work, on top of the foundation, he hired somebody to come in and do that. Well, this crew came in, and after the first week, my, my dad, of course, he was out there every day looking at it, but after the first week, he finally said to the contractor, these walls are all crooked. You need to tear it down and start over again. And so my dad said, I'm not going to pay you if you're going to do work like this. So they tear it down, and they put it back up again, and it's the same thing all over again. A week later, he's telling the guy, you still, everything's out of whack and it's not plumbed right. The walls are leaning in some places, they're leaning out other places. And he says, you gotta tear it down. And he says, matter of fact, tear it down and just go. 
I'll get it taken care of on my own. And, and so he, did, he finally ended up doing the brickwork himself there. But it was a really interesting process. And then another, another illustration that I can give you as far as foundations go and the importance of a good, solid foundation for a building of God's people would be. Um, I was sharing with Ted, I think, this morning. We have an 1897 home that we live in. And originally, it had a summer kitchen that was built separate from it and then over the years before we bought it it got attached to the rest of the house and so as the years progress a hundred years later of course the foundation that they used for the summer kitchen were barn beams well guess what the barn beams sitting on the ground rotted and we got to the point where our counters were going like this and the sink was actually sinking and so on. And it just goes to give you that idea of without a, without a good foundation, the building comes to naught and it'll eventually crumble and, and fall apart. And this is what God is getting at here in, in Corinthians when he talks about this whole idea of Paul beginning with the foundation in order that we, may can, we can be built up together as a body of believers. Now again, this is to encourage the individual to mature and to process. And in so doing, we all do that together. We all come together and we're all built up and we're all edified. So as I'm looking at this and trying to understand this, there's another, there's another scripture that comes to play that came in my thoughts as I was reading. And one of the things that I have tried to do faithfully um, probably for the last year is that at least once a month I read through all of Paul's writings. Now there's other stuff that gets included in that. And in my readings, I read from Psalms and I read from Proverbs and I read one of the Gospels and I read Acts and I read Hebrews and Revelation and I try to get through a prophet or two. But every month I try to get through Paul's letters and one of the verses that stuck out to me is in Colossians chapter 2 and it fits right in it's really interesting because this fits right in with this whole idea of husbandry and building and, and being um, these metaphors for what it looks like when we come together as a group of people in order to encourage one another so if you go to Colossians chapter 2 And we want to be in, uh, let's look for a beginning of the sentence here. We're going to look at verse 6. Colossians 2, beginning of verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with all thanksgiving. So all of a sudden this metaphor about husbandry and this metaphor about uh, a craftsman or a carpenter that's building their house, it comes, it comes back up in Paul writing the letter to the Colossians. And he says the goal is that you be rooted and that you be built up. So I'm thinking about that, thinking about this whole issue of, first off, of being rooted, if we stay with the, the metaphor of planting and harvesting and growing fruit and, and everything, this whole idea of a root. And I know all of you have seen the illustrations and the drawings. One of the things that I thought was 
and I think is probably general knowledge if you do any kind of outdoor studies at all with uh, forestry and so on is that typically the root system of a tree is as extensive as the crown is above it. So when you look at a tree and you said it all, all the branches spread out and the leaves and everything, what you see above ground with that crown of the tree is reflected in the root system underneath the ground that's supporting that tree. And that's sort of the idea here that Paul's getting at here in Colossians 2 and 7 is that we are rooted. And of course Psalm 1, as a tree planted by the rivers, bringeth forth fruit. So a good tree, a strong tree is going to be rooted. And I saw this, I saw this presented excellently, if you will, recently. One of the YouTube channels I follow is a guy, uh, a couple from Pennsylvania, it's called Outdoor with, with Morgans. They have a hundred acres where they're, they have a sawmill and they're cutting firewood and they're doing all of this kind of, kind of stuff, improving the land that they've been given. And they ended up having to take out some trees in order to build a new garage that they're putting in place. And one of the trees they took out was a walnut tree. And that had a root system like you would not believe. He's in there with a 18,000 pound excavator and these roots are just giving him a horrible time. He's trying to, to take out the roots first so that he could topple the tree over. And huge roots sinking down into the ground. And I was just watching his latest update yesterday, and he's doing some other stuff now that he's finished graded the thing. He's putting in some drainage pipes, and he's still fighting these roots that are this big around that were a foot underground and 20 or 30 feet away from where the trunk of that walnut tree was. And so hardwood trees especially have, have a good root system, and they need it for the way they grow. And then he had a couple of evergreens there too. And he had to take those evergreens out because he was doing it. And he, and he pulled those things up. And I'm telling you, these trees were 25, 30 feet tall. And the root system was maybe this big around. And very shallow, maybe this deep. It was just unreal to, to picture how different types of trees that God has put together, you've got this root system. One is strong and deep and spread out, and then others are just shallow. Sort of makes me wonder why I see so many evergreen trees when you get the storms coming in and been blown over on their sides because there isn't the root system isn't there for them to um, withstand those winds. And part of that has to do, I think, if we imply the apply it to the topic that we're looking at here today is that ever, evergreen trees aren't meant to be loners out there. You see groups of evergreen trees together. And so they protect one another from the storm, whereas the hardwood trees flourish more even when they're by themselves because they have this root system that goes down and spreads out. And then the other thing he says here in Colossians 2 7 is that we are built up in him. So not only are we rooted in Christ as a group of people when we come together, not only are we rooted together in Christ, but we are also built up together. And that's exactly what he told us in, in Ephesians 4 that we edify and we build up and we encourage one another to grow and mature in Christ. And he says here, and again, as I'm doing this study, and it, it's a process that's happened over time, and I'm thinking about these, and I'm saying, when I say over time, I'm thinking maybe three or four months that I've been earnestly seeking God's will and direction. You know, I know it wasn't any surprise for God, but COVID, this whole COVID thing sure seems to be a surprise to everybody else. 
because trying to find a public building that you can rent either inexpensively or even more expensively is is pretty impossible right now because of this covid thing they don't want they don't want to rent out or lease out a building for groups of people to come together and then spread the covid thing so it's been an interesting process but as i've looked at the scriptures and moved through this whole thought process of, process of what is going on this colossian passage came came in there to play rooted and built up in him and established in the faith so I grabbed after I'd done this whole thinking about being rooted and built up then I moved on to this well what's this established part what's going on there what does God what's God trying to say here so as I'm thinking about these scriptures and I do a word study I just do put establish in and of course if you're following any of the grace folks right now online you know there's a whole big foo for all going on between uh, some of the the grace pastors between is there a difference between the word establish and the word establish in the Bible and you got some guy in Connecticut and Tennessee saying one thing and another guy in Michigan saying something else and it's been a really interesting thing but God uses both words and sometimes in the same book he uses both words differently and separately so we're going to look at them differently and separated and separately here but he uses this term establish that you might be that you might be established fixed fitted in the Lord Jesus Christ and so the, the last passage I want you to look at today is that in order to establish the believer Paul goes on and tells us what is necessary for that to happen in, in, in his letter. So flip with me, if you will. First off, flip with me over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, just for a second. And in the introductory portion, which goes from 1 1 through 1 17, Paul gives his purpose for writing to the Romans and that comes out in verse 11 he says for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established so there we are back to the these two words they're related and yet they're differently and they're different so Paul's purpose in writing the book of Romans and his purpose in wanting to visit them is that there, there might be something established there, that Paul might establish something for the believers. And then if you just flip to the last chapter of Romans, Romans 1, I'm sorry, Romans 16, and we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. And this, this is where I think Paul answers the issue of what what is included and what is necessary for a church a local church what is necessary for the believer to be established to be rooted to be built up and there's three things here that I want us to see so we're going to look at verses 25 and 26 it says now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory 
through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. There's three things here Paul says it's necessary for the believer, for the local church to work at, to establish, to make them fit and complete. The first is an understanding of what Paul says is my gospel or his gospel. If we don't understand that, we are never going to be rooted and built up and grounded where we need to be. And we see that over and over again in the denominations that are around us. There's a complete and total misunderstanding of what the gospel is. I came across recently somebody writing and saying the gospel is good news. And it was blown. They would, when a king or someone would come into an area, the herald would get out there with the trumpet and blow the trumpet. It's good news the king has arrived. Well, that may have been the gospel that John the Baptist and the Twelve and the Lord Jesus Christ were preaching about the arrival of the king. But that is not the gospel that Paul says was given to him. And of course, I know you folks, I know you've been grounded really well here. You know that Paul's gospel is best summed up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen of the twelve of more than five hundred and of me Paul says last of all as one born out of due time so the, the first ingredient in, a, in establishing a local congregation and supporting this righteous man who's like a tree planted by the rivers of water is Paul's gospel, my gospel, he says in uh, Romans 16, 25. The second thing that he includes here that is absolutely necessary in order for us to be established is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. So, Ted, Brother Ted was sharing mystery wisdom today. Wisdom that was hid. He used that same phrase, Ted, since, the world, since before the world began. It was kept a mystery. It was kept hidden. There's a revelation that Paul has been given that nobody else knew before, that God had not revealed it, he kept it in himself until the Lord Jesus Christ revealed it to the Apostle Paul beginning in Acts chapter 9. I don't think as I read through the scriptures, I don't think Paul got it, got it all in one shot, but that as he, he was given a vision and as he matured, matured in that knowledge, then there were other visions and there was other understanding, there was other revelation that Jesus was giving to Paul. So that by the time you get to the end of Acts, in Acts 28, he has the full knowledge of what that revelation of the mystery is. And of course, the letter that brings that out best of all is the book of Ephesians, especially Ephesians chapter 3. So that's the second thing. We've got an understanding of his gospel, and we've got an understanding of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation and the mystery. And then the third thing that's necessary for a believer and a church to be grounded and rooted and established and being built up to God is by the scriptures of the prophets. So as we mature as, as believers and as a church, we come to understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All scripture is for our benefit. It's not all to us. And we understand that we are to rightly divide the word of God, the word of truth. And we're to study to do that. And of course, I've heard it said many times, and maybe you have, it's not to divide between error and truth. 
because there are no there is no error in the word of God the whole thing is truth so it's to rightly divide the truth and understand that God's truth to the prophets and to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament needs to be understood in its distinctions and in its similarities between the truth that God revealed to Paul in this dispensation of grace that we live in. So we've got these three things going on. And, and of course, he sums it all up here by saying that, that it is a commandment. Now, I know as, as a grace believer, and as grace believers, we, don't, we get kind of antsy with this idea of commandments. We start talking about commandments, and we start thinking about, oh, this this is this is Old Testament law stuff here. We don't want commandments. We're 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 grace people. Matter of fact, there's a whole group of folks based out of Texas called free grace people. They don't want anything to do with commandments at all. But this is a commandment that God has made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So if this is the goal, if this is the, if the end product here is a person, a group of people coming together as a local body of believers to be rooted and grounded and established, these are the three things we need. A gospel that's unique and given to Paul, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation and Mystery, and an understanding of the prophets and the scriptures that the prophets were given. When we have all these things coming together, then we've got a, a foundation that's not built out of barn beams that's going to rot and crumble and come apart. We have a good, solid tree that has a, a functioning root system that roots the, roots the tree, it roots the believer in place so that as the winds blow, you're not tossed to and fro and you're not tipped over. Actually, Paul uses the term shipwreck, but I think it's the same idea. Most often ships get wrecked in the storms of life. And Paul's goal here, God's goal through the Apostle Paul is to make sure that we aren't being tipped, that we're established, that we're rooted, that we're built up together. So that's what's been going on in my thinking regarding this. And I, I wanted, when Ted, Pastor Ted asked me a few weeks ago to, if I would fill in, this was the thing that I wanted to um, share with you if you've got some feedback let me know I'm interested in these things I'm interested in understanding what God is doing what God does through a local church why some of the local churches that I've been involved with and I've been familiar with why are they having issues and uh, I think it's because they're not established in these truths that we find scattered throughout especially the letters to the Apostle Paul. Let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing here as we close. Heavenly Father, just thank you again for today. We thank you, Lord, for these saints here. We thank you for the time that we can come together and open your word and allow you to just speak to us from the scriptures. All of these things that come forth from this pulpit the most important, Lord, is your word because you promised to uphold that and to uh, send it forth and to allow it to accomplish your purposes in the hearts and the minds uh, of your people. And we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's, that it's there for us, it's preserved, that it's all true, and that we can stand upon it. Father, be with these, these saints here as they go forth this, today to their their families and their homes and throughout their work week just give them grace lord and mercy and love for the for the community that they come in contact with that we can 
share your love and share your fellowship. It's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Okay, let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn 293. We all know. Thank you uh, very much, Bill, for taking the time to prepare and uh, share some of God's word with us this morning. Um, really, really thankful that we have an understanding of God's word rightly divided, that we have an understanding uh, of that mystery. Um, we've got truth and understanding in a completed word of God that never existed in the history of mankind before, and we are truly, truly blessed to have that, uh, to have that understanding. And um, it really is through that message that was given to us that we have the ability to understand those truths that you talked about this morning. So we're thankful for that. Uh, we'll take our hymnals and we'll turn to hymn 293, sing Amazing Grace before we're dismissed here this morning. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear. 